uh, to tonight's presenter. And, um, and this and tonight's meeting will be recorded. So you are seeing a message now about that recording. Please click the continue button uh, to stay with us. So uh, tonight's presentation is, uh, is presented by Phyllis Giacalone. And Phyllis is, um, she is an Arizona native. She grew up in the East Valley in the Chandler, Gilbert and Mesa area. Uh, in 2002, she started to volunteer at the Rose Garden at Mesa Community College, where she helped to maintain over 9,000 roses. And she loved working with the volunteers there and learning how to care for roses, teaching others how to care for roses. And so 10 years later in 2012, she got her um, official consulting rosarian degree through the American Rose Society and, uh, and started to teach classes about roses. And in 2013, we were fortunate enough to have Phyllis move to Prescott and, and join our Master Gardener program. So we really enjoy having uh, Phyllis as part of our crew. She is now volunteering at the uh, VA hospital in garden clubs in Yavapai County and HOAs and um, helping uh, everyone to learn how to grow roses and take care of them. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Phyllis. Phyllis, if you would like to uh, go ahead and share your screen at this time and get started. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Okay. And and uh, hang on just a second. Hey, can you see it? Phyllis, you might want to put it on slideshow. Um, I, yeah, I'm trying to find it. It's right behind the screen here. Let me shrink it a minute and then. How can I move this uh, thing? Do you see the word slideshow across the top of your screen? Yeah, I do now. I just, I had to shrink it in order to get to it okay. and then start from the beginning. Okay. There, do you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So I'm ready. It's all you, Phyllis, take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm really excited to uh, be here tonight and Glad all of you could join us. Uh, the timing couldn't be better because uh, spring is around the corner and uh, usually in Prescott, uh, we start pruning roses uh, the 15th of March uh, and outlying areas like Cottonwood, Chino Valley, Sedona, uh, Verde Valley, all of those are, that are a little bit lower a little bit warmer, usually start um, usually about maybe the first or second week in March, a little bit sooner. So I want to concentrate tonight in um, telling you a lot about pruning. So you'll have an idea of uh, what to expect. And so you won't be too uh, overwhelmed when you go out in your backyard. I want you to have the confidence to prune your own roses with confidence. And if you get scared, call me, I make house calls. So here we go with uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, history about the roses. Uh, in 1985, uh, Ronald Reagan decided that the uh, rose should be the national emblem for the United States. So that happened. And then in case you guys didn't know, the uh, Arizona state flower um, 
since 1901. It's the saguaro cactus blossom, which usually blooms in May and June. And if people don't uh, know that a lot, of, you don't hear a lot about it. So this is what we're gonna cover, uh, the different grades of roses, types of roses, fertilizers, pest programs, pruning roses, safety and questions. Um, according to the uh, American Nursery Standards of Road grazes, Grades, there's three different grades. Uh, first one is grade number one. And that means that it's been in the ground for at least two years. And it has at least three canes. And most of those are about three fourths in, inches in diameter. And it's well developed. And number grade one are about the only ones that I like to buy because you might pay a little bit more, but the chances are of it making it is gonna be a lot higher. And if it doesn't say grade one on the, the label, then it's not grade one. A lot of times you'll get uh, one and a half, which is like this one here. And that means it's not been in the ground for at least two years. You might only have maybe two canes and the roots haven't really developed yet. And then you have uh, grade number two, which is your bargain rose. And it's not very good at all. You just barely have a uh, little tiny canes and it's struggling to survive. So you don't really, want to buy that you'll you'll wish you hadn't there's three different ways to buy uh roses uh first there's the bare root and this one comes uh, a lot of times you'll see them in raised beds and they'll have it full of wet sawdust and you can pick it up and look at it and see how the root system is and everything and do you see here there's like four or five canes on this one so this one looks really good none of them are damaged or if you order them in the mail, they'll come a lot of times like this all in bundles. And then uh, the second way you get them, a lot of times they ship them to uh, stores. And what they do, they put the canes in a bag here with some uh, different kind of uh, potting soil in there. And then the canes will be above. Uh, but there's no way to water these uh, roses. So they will start drying out. So look and make sure a lot of times what they do is they dip the top half here in wax and you don't want to buy them if they have wax on them. Because once you start planting them in the ground, all this wax is going to just start melting off and it's not going to, you know, do very well. The best way to do it is to buy them either bare root or to buy them once, once it passes like the first part of the year, what they'll do is um, good nurseries will go ahead and just pot them up. And that way they have a good way of watering them and taking care of them. Uh, just and just make sure that, you know, you get one that's, uh, you look at the canes and make sure that they're going out in different directions. Uh, the, most, the six most popular types of roses. First, you have the hybrid teas, which they, which means that they have like, the long stems, and these are the ones you get like at floor shops and grocery stores. And not too many of them have a smell to them, but they look really pretty. And then you've got the florendas, and they have lots of blooms. Uh, in fact, they, you can see all these buds here. It's like you can, you can uh, cut off one stem and you can have a whole bouquet of roses. And it's more like a shrub type of rose. Uh, and these will be, this one is a Floribunda, which is um, more like a combination of a hybrid tea and a Floribunda, and it's a Grandiflora. And it just means that it's bigger blooms, bigger bush. And then you've got the, the mini flora here. And let me see if I can get my, okay. Then, um, then you've got the climbing roses and these are shrub roses. And a lot of times they're called like knockout roses, drift roses or carpet roses. And if you want a hedge like this, it's a lot of color and um, easy to take care of. Uh, nowadays they make them to where they're like disease resistant and they kind of deadhead them themselves and they just kind of fall off. You don't even have to go through and deadhead all of them. 
So like I was saying before, um, you know, we start pruning like in mid-March. And as soon as after I uh, prune them, and I usually spray them with neem. That way it gets rid of any uh, harboring uh, uh, bugs or diseases or anything. And it kind of gets it off to a good start. Then I'll add some compost, some slow release food, rose food or some alfalfa, and then a good layer of uh, a mulch to keep the moisture in. And then after, sort of like mid-April through September, after it starts leafing out, you I put down like, depending on the size of the bush, bush about a half to a cup of Epsom salts and water it in really good. And what this does, it creates new canes to grow. Uh, they call them basil breaks, but they're actually just new canes coming up and they'll look sort of like a reddish purplish color. So if you see that, don't cut it back, let it, let it grow. And after the, about every two months, I try to add more systemic rose food. And if you want uh, bigger blooms or better blooms, just, add some uh, fish emulsion. But I never fertilize after September because then it starts cooling off and any new growth that you get is just gonna die back because you know it's starting to get cold at night. So don't fertilize after September. Okay, and then these are the problems that you're gonna have. Uh, aphids, thrips, cane borers, spider mites, leaf cutter bees and powdery mildew. Uh, this is a picture of aphids. Sometimes they can be green, yellow, brown, red, black. Most of the ones that I've seen are either yellow or green, but mostly uh, what I like to do, I don't use chemicals at all in my garden. So I just try to turn on the water hose really high and just wash them off and I put on gloves and I just knock them off with my fingers. And if that doesn't work, then you can make up some, you know, soapy water and try to treat that. But if you're doing that every day, pretty soon they will, it'll break their uh, cycle and hopefully they won't be there. But they're mostly just like on the buds and the stems right here. And here you see a, la a ladybug, she's crawling up there so she can eat the the aphids. So ladybugs are a great thing to have in your garden. These are thrips, and this is a picture of the, uh, with the in the larvae stage. And he, what he does is he goes in there and he lays these eggs and then all of them start hatching out and they eat the edges of the petals. They only affect the buds. So it's sort of a, cosmetic thing, but it's not going to open up and when it up, it's not going to look very pretty. So a lot of times I just cut the buds off in order to get rid of it. Or they do make certain organic sprays that you can use and you only have to spray the buds, not the whole plant. But nowadays in the store, they have a lot more organic products than they used to. So make sure. This is what it looks like when a cane borer gets in there and he'll go down uh, pretty far. And the further he goes, the more that whole cane is going to die. So when you're pruning, if you see this, uh, I keep cutting back a little bit at a time, each section till you get past where that little worm is. And then I take and I use wood glue and I, has to be wood glue, not white glue, because wood glue has, it forms like a little scab on there, and it'll keep the the uh, the uh, cane bores from getting back in there again. This is spider mites. You'll see it, it'll look like web cobwebs. It's usually in the summertime when it's hot and it's sticky, and they'll get on the backside of leaves and on it's, and I just use, I hose off really, strong in the morning, just hose them off really well. You can get rid of them or you can use soapy water. This is from um, a leaf cutter bees and it doesn't hurt your plant at all. What they do is they cut out this little circle and they take the circle to go make their nest out of it. 
I uh, turned on my fountain one time only to find out that they kept sticking these little circles down inside there. Once I turned on the fountain, they just big old plop come up through the fountain. So it doesn't hurt. So there's nothing you can do about it. You're just, you know, it's just, um, just cosmetic. Uh, this is powdery mildew. And this is caused by cool, damp nights, warm days, and sometimes it's spread by wind or poor air circulation. If your roses are planted too close together, or if you water the leaves too late in the day, and it doesn't have time, the plant doesn't have time to dry off, then it could cause mildew. It's like little tiny blisters, or it could be like this powdery on the, um, usually on the buds and the stems right here at the top. But a lot of times I'll just take water and wash and hose all this off, or you can cut it down here, just get rid of it. Or here's a little recipe where you can mix up uh, baking soda, half a teaspoon of liquid soap, horticultural soap into a gallon of water and put it in a spray bottle. Um, here's some beneficial um, things for you. Uh, the hoverfly, and this is a lace wings. And this is the larva to the lace wings. And you can see, in, even in the larva stage, here it is running around eating these aphids. And then this is what it's like when it becomes an adult. And of course, the ladybug. This is what she looks like when she's little on the, on the branch. And then as she develops, she'll turn into something that looks like this. And then finally, as that's her adult stage. And the praying mantis will look like this on the branch. And, uh, and then as an adult, uh, but be careful of the great big, especially the big brown uh, praying mantis because the big, uh, a lot of the bigger ones will eat your monarch caterpillars. So usually when I see a brown praying mantis, a big one, I'll relocate him to another location somewhere far, far away. <laughs> uh, these are the things that you're going to need um, in your toolbox when you're doing roses. Uh, you'll need alcohol when you're pruning in between different bushes or different gardens. If you're going to go to the VA and then over to somebody else's house, you need to mix up a bucket of, uh, I, I think it's one part alcohol to nine parts water and mix that up and then dip your tools in there so you can uh, uh, sterilize them that way. Uh, here's a set of pruners. They're bit grass which means that the two blades uh, bypass each other. You don't want to use the kind like scissors that all that will do is just smash them. It won't have a clean cut. And then you're going to want some gloves that come way up on your arm because if you don't, you'll end up looking like my son when he tries to get the cat into the cat carrier to take her to the vet your arms will be all scratched up. And you'll need some long uh, loppers uh, for when you need to get right down there and get the larger um, canes. And then the wood glue, uh, this is what you use to um, seal up those uh, canes. Anything that's bigger than a pencil, you'll need to use the wood glue to Dab a little bit either with the uh, top of the can or use a popsicle stick to just kind of go over it. And here's a saw that you can use for the bigger, bigger branches that you can't get with the loppers. Why do we prune? Well, in the wintertime, we prune when the plant is dormant and that's to stimulate new growth. When the rest of the year, we just do what they call deadheading where throughout the growing season. And the more you deadhead, the more flowers you're gonna have because otherwise it takes time to, for those to drop off by themselves. So if you get out there and deadhead, um, the more flowers you're gonna have. 
okay, sometimes when you're looking at a bush and it's all leaf out and it's kind of intimidating and you're not sure, sometimes I kind of just hover over the top of it, look down on top of it to see where I'm going to start. Um, you can't see the forest for the trees sometimes. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, start cutting out any of the branches that are crossing over on top of each other. And then you're going to be cutting out anything that's dead. And you're going to be cutting it way down towards the bottom. Anything that looks diseased. If there's any suckers, they'll be underneath this uh, graft union right here. They'll come up. Uh, you might have to take a shovel and dig back a little bit to see if it's coming from underneath here. And if it is, you've got to cut it back all the way back down here. And then anything that's uh, smaller than a pencil. And by the time you do all of these things, your bush is starting to open up and you take all the leaves off. And then you're kind of getting an idea of what, how you want your bush to shape because you want your shape, your bush to be open. And then you're gonna go back through and you're gonna cut it down probably about a third to half of the bush. Here's an example of uh, something that's crossing. It's totally out of line. So you would go clear back to here, right here, and cut that out of there. And here's something that's dead. So there's a uh, different, uh, need to uh, prune these out of there. Here's some more examples. This one's dead. This one's dead. Looks like this one even has a cane bore in it. So you're gonna go all the way back down to the bottom here to cut that off. This one's dead and this one is. So get those all out of there and clean them all up. And the right way to do it is you're going to look for where there's a bud eye on an outward facing branch. Like this, this is the outside. So you're gonna find this butt eye, which is right there. And if you can't find a butt eye, if there was a stem there, then that is also a butt eye. And you're gonna cut a fourth of an inch uh, downward towards the middle of the bush. So this is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way because it's, two, it's more than a quarter of an inch. So what's gonna happen is your bush is gonna to have to die back all of this instead of putting effort and energy into this growing, it's gonna take time to this to come down first. And this one's too short. So you can't, uh, it doesn't have really the room to, to sprout out like this one does. Uh, when I first started at the VA, they had a lot of old, old bushes. And what we did is we took a wire brush and we kind of uh, brushed off all this old crusty wood that's not letting the air and sunshine in. So we uh, kind of used a brush and got that off of there. And then we put a cup of Epsom salts around there and watered it in really good. And sure enough, here come like up some new canes were growing like these right here. They start growing. Okay, so. On a hybrid tea, you're gonna leave about five to eight canes. Um, and it could be up to 12, depending on if they're really in good shape. And the amount uh, to prune is gonna be, depending on how tall it is already, you're, but you're gonna cut back about a third to a half of the bush. Uh, a lot of people I've seen, uh, cut it way down to like a foot or foot and a half. And you don't need to do that. It's not, you don't need to bring it back like it's a brand new, you know, out of the package. You, you know, as long as it's doing good and it's big, I mean, leave it that way. What you're doing is just reviving the whole thing. So here again, uh, go in and remove the dead wood. Anything that's crossing, any suckers, anything that's thinner than a pencil. 
And then you just start taking, if you do all of that, just start taking off and bring it down. And you try to get it almost all approximately the same. I mean, if there's one that's really good and you don't want to, you know, leave it a little bit higher, that's okay. But you try to make it to where it's kind of in proportion. This is what a hybrid tea looks like when you get done. So you've got all these good canes and you're going to the outside and you're getting airflow in there. And this one's already starting to uh, come back with new leaves. Uh, just like this one, and it's, a, it's a grandiflora and it can get, you know, four to eight feet tall. Uh, so what you're gonna do is leave at least three to seven canes and you're gonna cut it back like a third to half and open all this up. So you have a lot there to uh, dispose of. And we don't suggest uh, composting or uh, composting the leaves or anything because it could be harboring diseases and everything. The only way I've ever been able to uh, use any of this is if you know somebody that has goats, Goats love to eat all these branches, regardless of all the stickers, they just love it anyway. And this is uh, the uh, uh, floor bunder, and uh, it gets a lot more canes than a hybrid tea, but uh, you're gonna go in and you need to thin it out so it's not all crowded, and you're still gonna take off about half of the bush. And this, this is what it could look like. This one's an older one, but still look, these are all in really good shape. And you've taken it back down to probably like three feet. Uh, this one, I guess they decided to leave it in the middle because it looked really healthy. But nothing's crossing and nothing's interfering with anything in there. So it's okay to leave it. Um, these are the uh, shrub roses. So actually, you can't go in there and fine tune them. You can even use a hedge, head, uh, electric hedge clim clip, clippers and just, you know, just uh, whack them off at the top and bring them down to like uh, take off the top two thirds of the plant. And then the, uh, on the climbing rows, you'll see down here at the bottom, what you're gonna do is uh, keep about, about three or four of the major canes on each side and you're gonna cut off all these other little things and keep all the major ones, but you're gonna cut off all the leaves and everything smaller than a pencil and um, keep the major ones. And what I like to do is get um, pipe cleaners, green ones, it's just so they blend in better, uh, like at the craft store. And I will use pipe cleaners to train them to grow on the uh, trellis or whatever you're training it to grow up to. And then that way too, you can move them around as it grows or you can keep changing it. But you're still gonna cut, cut off anything that's crossing or anything that's dead. Okay, this is uh, safety. Always wear sunblock and a hat to protect yourself from UV rays. And my dermatologist is really adamant about this. Um, always get a tetanus shot every 10 years because you're working with soil and it's time to get your physical, um, ask your uh, physician uh, if they've got a record of you having a tetanus shot. And if not, they can go ahead and get you one at that time because it lasts for 10 years. Always wear with long sleeves, gloves, eye protection, especially if you're on a ladder and you're doing a, a climbing bush. I mean, those branches can flip back and hit you in the eye. And if you're spraying chemicals, wear a mask and wash all the clothes separately in your laundry. Um, I, like I said, I don't use any chemicals. My garden is to enjoy. And I have animals and birds and butterflies and hummingbirds and everything. And I just don't take any chances with chemicals. About the only 
friends of mine that I know that use chemicals are the ones that show their roses and rose shows and they want them all to be perfect. So they uh, strive to get perfect roses. Mine, I don't care if they're perfect. Uh, always wear closed toe shoes, no open toes when you're gardening. Never spray chemicals if the wind is blowing. The best time to spray is early in the morning when it's cool and the air is still and never spray if it's over 80 degrees. And if you are gonna spray, try to use organic sprays to protect the good bugs and be environmentally friendly. Here are a couple of uh, uh, websites that you can go to if you um, wanna look at them. Here's the one for the American Rose Society, which I belong to since that's what we work out of. And here's another one for pest and disease. And then we have questions. So I can, if you want, I can take questions if anybody has any in the chat box. That was awesome, Phyllis. Thank you so much. I, uh, I know I personally learned a lot about rose care. <laughs> Um, good, good. So, uh, so the questions we're we're going to take questions through the chat box, and I see a few our uh, questions are starting to roll in. So, um, Phyllis, our first question comes from Marianne Douglas, and she's asking, "Do you ever put weed cloth or mulch under them to cut down on weeding?" I do. Uh, Yes, yes, I do, because a lot of times uh, I use the, the cloth that you put down and use the pins to pin it and then put the mulch on top of it, yes. Okay, so is there a particular cloth that you prefer? Maybe the black landscape cloth or a... Uh, or... <laughs> yes, the mm -hmm. black landscape cloth. Okay. Okay, great. And then Paula is asking, how do I prove single flowering plants? Uh, is she talking about a, a hybrid tea? Single flowering plant. Single flowering plant. So maybe Paula, if you want to, to post a, um, an example, an example of something that you mean by single flowering plant, yes. Um, Joan Pierce is asking, what is a typical lifespan for a rose bush? Oh my goodness, it can last for 50 years or more. If you really can, 50 years? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. I bet there's some at the VA that are that old. Really? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, because if you keep pruning it and taking care of it and put the Epsom salts to get new canes, you can, you know, keep keep it going. That's impressive. <laughs> so uh, Teresa Paul is asking, can established roses be transplanted? They can. In fact, I brought 50 up with me when I came to the valley, from the valley up here. And 55 but, zero? Yes, <laughs> 55. <laughs> but it has to be the time of the year when they're dormant. Don't dig them up in the middle of summer because then they will go into shock. But I moved up here in February. And so I hired some guys to help me. We dug them up and put them in pots, brought them up here and um, set them out and back. I actually did raised beds. So I just kind of took them out of the pot and kind of set them there and backfilled. Wow. Wow. I just, I'm going to add a corollary question of my own. Do they go through transplant shock like other plants do? Um, they could. Uh, a couple of them that I brought up didn't make it. Um, it they weren't used to the cold. Mm. Um, but usually cold doesn't matter to roses too much. Um, I think it was just, I wasn't here and nobody was watering them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wasn't a transplant thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay. So our next question comes from Sarah uh, Amiati, and I hope I'm pronouncing that last name correctly, but Sarah is asking, 
Uh, my roses are covered in red leaves already. Should I wait to prune until March 15th? Uh, what area does she live in? I don't know. I don't we can we can ask her if if she's in Yavapai County, but I don't know. Well, if she's in Prescott, Prescott Valley, usually, Prescott Valley, yeah. I would say wait until. I've looked at the 10 day forecast and I don't see any like major storms coming through or anything, but I would wait until like next week and then check the weather again. And um, she could probably do it the first or second week in March okay. and make sure she can leave the new leaves on there, but make sure you get all the old green ones off. Okay, good answer. Um, Marion Douglas is asking another question. Uh, if you do put the weed cloth down, she wants to know <laughs> how do you fertilize? <laughs> how do you get the fertilizer through that weed cloth? <laughs> Marion is one of my mentees and she works with me at the VA. She <laughs> okay. watched me do this. It was <laughs> funny because we put uh, the cloth down on in between the rows of roses that we planted. And so I try to leave about a foot away, foot or two away from the, around the rows so I can still put the fertilizer down. Okay, so you leave I a rather large out. opening available yeah. for the yeah. ground space. Okay, right. okay. <laughs> um, so uh, kind of, Connie Vargas posting, I'm not sure if this is a question or just a, a confirmation, asking for a confirmation from you, but uh, Connie is saying, I always thought we are supposed to prune in January and February. Down in the valley, we always prune starting in January and February because we had to have them all done by the end of February because the heat comes sooner there and you want them to leaf out, uh, but not up here. Not up here. Okay. Yeah. Like okay. Uh, when I was down there last weekend, they are almost all done pruning uh, the rose garden. Okay. <laughs> really big difference. Big it difference is, a, it is a big difference between us and Phoenix for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Teresa Paul is asking Is there a way I can pre prevent my rose bush from being so tall? Uh, you can. Uh, yes, you can keep keep it pruned down, you know, not a bunch. The only time you want to do a bunch is, you know, the when it's dormant in the winter. Mm -hmm. But you can always keep it under control by pruning off a foot or two, you know, and keeping it under um, from going going crazy. Okay. Okay, good. Um, this might be a, a a question to Mary Barnes, but Connie Varga wants to know if she's going to get be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint. And uh, and I think the answer to to Connie's question is that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. But um, we don't normally put the PowerPoints out there. Is there is there a handout, Phyllis, that's posted online? I think we have been posting the PowerPoints for these presentations. So if it's okay with Phyllis, it will be with the YouTube link on our website. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there you That's go, Connie. The YouTube or the YouTube and the PowerPoint are both posted. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. And they'll, they'll do that what tomorrow, Mary? Or when? Um, give us a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of days and then it should be on the website. That way you don't have to take notes or anything. You can just refer back to it. <laughs> okay. I told so, you that in the beginning. <laughs> um, so we asked Paula to clarify her question, her original question, which was how do I prune a single flowering plant? And her clarification is heritage. Heritage. Oh, okay. Um, you do it just like any other um, hybrid tea. Uh, you won't do it until March. 
and you take all the leaves off and everything just like anything else. I have a, a heritage and it's beautiful and it, it'll come back. It will come back. Okay. And yeah. Paula's, Paula then posted that Rosa Mundy is the one that she has. Rosa, I'm not familiar with that one, but uh, you know, like the slide showed, showed um, they're all pretty much the same, except uh, Floribundas and Grandiflores have a lot more um, canes. Mm -hmm. uh, just make sure that you thin them out enough to where they're not uh, crowding each other and crossing. Uh, but you can leave as many as you want there and just take it down to like, if it's five feet tall, bring it down to three feet tall. Okay. Oh, there's a picture. <laughs> is that a cactus? That looks like a cactus. <laughs> so uh, I don't think Rosemary knows her video is on. Okay, <laughs> so continuing on with our, our questions in the chat box, uh, Marion Johnson is asking who or which is your favorite rose grower? Uh, right now, a Weeks Roses has been really terrific. They have been sending us, donating roses to us. They're in California. Uh, but there's others, uh, you know, and we're not supposed to mention names or anything like that. That's right. Um, we don't advertise. <laughs> no, no, we don't. But um, there's a lot of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, Paul Schnur uh, is posting. He says, I have a rose garden in Sedona that my mother planted many years ago. The trees have grown tall around the garden. Do you have some rose examples that are shade tolerant? Uh, they need to have, most roses need about five to six hours of sunshine. Um, what I had to do when I moved up here, I put about 10 that were in a spot to where it was getting too much shade. So I waited until, uh, you know, March or February, March and went in there dormant and I moved them. If the, mm -hmm. he has that opportunity to move them to a sunnier location or trim the tree. <laughs> the <more. laughs> yeah, open up sunshine. Yeah, roses like sunshine for sure. They, they get that black spot, right? If they're in too much shade. You know, here in Arizona, I have never had black spot. Um, oh, we've seen it on the help desks. Yes, uh, if they get too wet, you know, you can get black spot, but I have never had any on mine. Okay. Not here. <laughs> too dry. <laughs> you're you're a good you're a good rose mother. That's why. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that 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 answered his question. Then um, thank you, Paul. Okay. Cheryl is saying, um, is there a way to determine if an overgrown rose plant is a climbing rose or a rose bush? so that she knows how to prune it? Well, uh, a climbing rose will just kind of put out these big long shoots. Um, and it'll want some tribe, uh, or you can even train one that isn't, uh, put up a trellis or uh, arch and just start using, you know, some pipe cleaners and just train it. Uh, to go the direction you want it to go and see if that works out for her. So maybe Shelly or Cheryl can prune it to be the shape that she wants it to be. Right, Regardless. this time, of, yeah. In the next couple of weeks, just uh, cut back what you don't want and train, uh, get a trellis or a arch and train it the way you want it to go. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, Carolyn Shelley. Uh, it's, I think she has maybe a grandiflora. She's saying, how far apart should bushes be planted? At least three feet. Three feet, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Paul is questioning and uh, posting another question. Paul Schnur is saying the Mesa Community College Rose Garden uses flood irrigation. Is mm -hmm. that better than drip or spray? Uh, you know, because we have 9,000 rose bushes there and 
we are on their campus and that's how they water the whole campus is flood irrigation. It comes twice a month in the summer and once a month in the winter. So we take advantage of that and use that. We have these gates we have to close off to different areas and it totally floods the whole. In fact, it's we have to build up in each section to where we uh, flood one section at a time. Mm. And it saves money on the water bill for the college. So, you know, we started out there with the uh, uh, 1997, where uh, the president uh, got a phone call saying that uh, his landscaping looked really boring. And so he called the Rose Society and said, can you come over and plant a few roses? <laughs> and, <Thank you. laughs> and, and every year we plant more. We get donations <laughs> from different growers and then it just grew and grew and grew and it's still growing. Nice, very nice. <laughs> but we do have um, a lot of times when um, it's really, really hot down there, we do have hoses and we have some areas that do have uh, a drip areas to them just to subsidize if we think that they're getting too dry. Yeah, and I know many of our homeowners in Yavapai County use drip air irrigation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you, it, it's a public garden. You can come down anytime, uh, just park and self-guided tour. We have a lot of those signs where you can just walk up there and call the number on the sign and it'll explain um, that area. Sounds pretty awesome. I need to go visit that. Uh, two years in a row, we took, a, we made like a road trip and we all got together and went down, uh, had lunch, uh, toured the rose garden and we went to the uh, rose show afterwards and then came home so great. that's great fun they they <laughs> didn't have the rose show this year though so in it's usually in november uh -huh. uh, so maybe this november if mm -hmm. uh we'll if cross our fingers okay, we'll, we'll have a, a road, road trip again that's right okay very cool well the the questions keep rolling in. So Phyllis, as, as long as you have uh, time, we'll, we'll continue forward. Are you okay on time? Sure, sure. Okay, great. Okay, so our next question comes from Lauren Paz. And Lauren is asking, is there anything you can put on roses to keep the deer from eating them in the fall and winter? A fence. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, I know I, a friend of mine has uh, HOA and they won't let him put up a fence. And um, I think there are some deer repellent things that you can put on bushes. Uh, you'd probably have to ask at a nursery mm -hmm. uh, what those things are. Yeah, because um, any kind of spray is going to be washed away with December rains if there are such a thing. Yeah, or maybe there are things that you can hang in the in trees or something to scare the, uh, or maybe you put up a motion sensor to where the watering system comes spraying on, you know, and scares the deer away. Yeah, I've been caught in neighbors' uh, motion ac activated water spray before. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you should have been in their yard. <laughs> Maybe I should have gone down the driveway instead of cut through the yard. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Teresa Paul is asking if there is a type of neem product that you recommend. Uh, no, not really. It's just neem oil and it comes as a concentrate and you just follow the directions on the bottle and I use it for the fruit, fruit trees and the roses. It, it's the same time of the year. So once you get pruned, everything, just use it on everything. Spray it down. Okay. Um, Shelly Wolmer is asking when fertilizing with alfalfa, do you use mm -hmm. alfalfa cubes or can I use my horse's alfalfa from a bale? Um, no. Uh, it comes, it's best to get it, um, I used the cubes one time, uh, but I found out my dogs like to eat them for treats and you don't want them doing that. So 
I now get either uh, the little tiny pellets that sort of like rabbit food, the smaller pellets, and that way they break down quicker. Um, or you can get alfalfa meal, which is like a powder. It's just looks oh. like green powder. And that really is, is kind of messy because you go to scoop it and it'll fly up in your face. But, uh, <laughs> it becomes a, cl uh, a green cloud. <laughs> but it's really good for uh, nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really like to use it because it breaks down slowly and uh, it really makes, creates a lot of earthworms too. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah. I've used alfalfa pellets in my vegetable garden. I like alfalfa. Okay. Uh, Lauren Paz is asking, how often do you water your roses during the summer? Oh, in the summer, I'm usually gone in summer. No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a drip system to everything. Uh, and usually what I do is I put it um, it's an inline system where it's a tube and it's got a hole every six inches because most of them, um, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, are on a, uh, in a row. Um, I water like 30 minutes every day in the summer when it's hot. It probably in the morning time. Are you watering 30 minutes in the morning time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Good answer. Okay. You, our you know, when it cools off, then you can back it off like every two or three days, you know, for 20 minutes or something, but just depends on the weather. Mm -hmm. or, or if it's going to rain, just, you know, turn it off for a day or two. Yeah. Natural rain's always good. Yeah. Okay. Our next question comes from Sam, uh, Sarah Amiati. And Sarah is asking, is there a category of rose that has the most scent? There are. Um, I have a, um, they send me every year a catalog of all the roses and whether they have a scent or not. Mm -hmm. um, if she wants to uh, get a hold of me, I can give her one of my old books and, and it tells you what if that has a scent or not um is there a, a is the, there a favorite catalog that that classifies them that maybe she can find online uh you might go on to a website um what is it i think it's weeks weeks roses has um a drop down where you can click on fragrant roses new roses, um, all the different kinds of different roses, but I think they have one for fragrant roses too. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so our next question comes from Carolyn Shelley and Carolyn is asking, what is the best way to prepare an old flower bed for new roses should the ground be tilled? Um, I, I would, I would do it just like a garden. I would like till it down, you know, six inches or something and break it up and um, add compost to it. And, uh, and then once you dig your holes, they're going to be at least two feet wide and two feet deep. So at that time too, you can, you're going to put 50-50 when you replant those roses, you're going to mix uh, compost and um, with the original dirt 50 50. Okay, great. And every, every three feet, three feet apart. And three feet apart. Yes. Yeah. So you could do the whole bed, but then you're going to do more to the, the existing holes that you're going to put. Okay. So you're amending the holes only, not the entire bed. Because once the roots start spreading out, you know, it'll be in the part that she amended originally. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, okay. 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 Great. Um, Marion Douglas is, uh, she is uh, saying, I heard that spraying ammonia would keep the javelina away by spraying a circle around your bushes, not on it. Would that keep deer away? Would that harm the plants? All my yard is fenced with chain link fencing, so I don't have 
Havelina. Uh, so I don't know. So I'd probably have her ask at a nursery <laughs> and see. I don't want to tell her to put ammonia down if it, I don't know. I don't I know about that. I don't know that, that answer either. So uh, Marion, if you want help with researching that answer, maybe try the uh, help desk and let those master gardeners do some some researching for you. I, I don't think I'd want the, the ammonia going down into my soil. I don't know what's in it and I don't- I'm not sure what it would do. I'm not sure that- I don't the trust it. The worms wouldn't like it, I'm sure. No. <laughs> They'd probably crawl up and and tell you about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so uh, Lee Atona is asking, um, how about pruning a cliff rose? Is it the same rules? Pruning a what? A cliff rose. The native rose. A cliff rose, like. I don't know what he's talking about. So, uh, so Lee, I have actually owned a, a cliff rose and um, my experience is that no, it's more like pruning a woody bush that it's, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't regrow the same way. So if you're pruning off a woody branch, that branch is pretty much gone and that's a, an open spot, a dead spot within the cliff rose bush. Um, but the cliff rose does root itself where it, where it attaches to the ground or where it sits on the ground. So is that like a lady banks or something or it's not, it's not that green and soft. It's, it's much more of a woody shrub. Okay, it's I'm it's a very dense that. woody shrub, but they're beautiful and they can grow quite, quite large. So I understand wanting to control their size and cut them back. Right. So, yeah, they're great. So, okay. Um, Carolyn Shelley is asking, what is the latest that roses can be planted? I would say here, and I imagine that's what she's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you can plant, if they're in a container, you can pretty much plant them any time of the year. Um, but bare root, you're going to want to, I would say, probably get them in by the end of April if it's bare root. But container, you can do them any time of the year because you're going to dig that hole and the roots are already established in there. Okay. Good answer. Well, very good. Well, I think we have come to the uh, conclusion of our questions, Phyllis. So I really appreciate your answers and sticking with uh, with all the wonderful questions that came in. And uh, you're getting a lot of accolades and thank yous in the chat box. People very much enjoyed your, your presentation. So thank you for doing this for us. Well, good. We really appreciate you. And, it, and, you know, if we get to go back to the VA, you know, they can come out there and help us out there and you'll get on on that's right. Hands on training, right? That's right. We really, really hope that these rose gardens start opening back up for all of us yep. to, to come visit and work in and volunteer in. So yeah, wonderful. Well, very happy, good. Happy pruning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for attending.